Welcome to Listen Here, the audiobook podcast where we bring you chapter listens of our much loved audiobooks and sometimes special guest appearances. Bills pile up, saving accounts go down and down, marriages can go south, pandemics rage on, work goes off the rails, stress is off the charts. And it's all so overwhelming that you feel powerless to calm life's chaos. The weight of everything bearing down on you is too much for you to take on by yourself. But don't worry, Max Lucado is here to tell you, help is here. Life is hard and it's easy to become weary of the challenges it presents. There are questions we cannot answer and problems we cannot solve. But Max teaches us that we can find strength and purpose in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful concept, right? Strength, purpose, power, peace. But what is the Holy Spirit? Do you understand it? Or is it a concept that always seems a bit mystifying, maybe confusing? Max is here to take this sometimes difficult theological topic and make it consumable for every person. Did you know there are over a hundred references to the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Did you know that Jesus says more about the Spirit than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future? The Holy Spirit can help you through tough times and bring joy to you in happy times. Join Max as he shows you there is no more walking this path alone and no more carrying the weight you were not intended to bear. Help Is Here is one of the few books Max has narrated himself which makes the audio experience extra special. Join me for a sneak peek of Help Is Here and stay tuned until the end of the episode for a sample of 316, The Numbers of Hope, the other best-selling self-narrated book by Max Lucado. Preface. Let's imagine you're on vacation. You load the car and drive to a mountain village hotel. Clean air, splendid vistas, cool weather, it's going to be great. Besides, this hotel is offering an end-of-season special that fits your budget. This is your chance to do what you've always wanted to do, hike the mountain trails. On the first morning, you're the first person out the door. No sleeping in for you, no siree. Pack on back, water bottle full, and enthusiasm level high. Trail map in one hand, walking stick in the other. What fun! The fun is short-lived. The trail is steep. Your new hiking boots are stiff. A few minutes up the trail, you wonder, did someone stuff sandbags in my backpack? You step to the side of the path to catch your breath. And that's when you hear the trail guide and his happy followers. He wears a wide-brimmed hat and speaks with a confident tone that makes you think he knows his stuff. He identifies the names of the flowers, describes the history of the trail, and he shares a few tips on the best way to have the best day of hiking. His followers aren't carrying gear, so they walk at a fast clip. The guide points out wildlife along the way and pauses to answer the hiker's questions. You consider tagging along and eavesdropping, but you didn't pay for a guide. Besides, you couldn't keep up. Within moments, the group is way ahead, and you lag behind with your increasingly uncomfortable load. After a few miles, you catch up. They are sitting in a meadow listening to the guide describe the vast mountain range. And they are eating lunch. Sandwiches, chips, sodas, and cookies. Are those homemade chocolate chip cookies? It's a feast. You sigh and wonder if the PB&J you brought is going to be soggy. No matter. You've lost your appetite. You turn and head down the trail. Enough misery for a day. The next morning, your muscles ache and your feet are swollen. It takes the better part of an hour and a box of Band-Aids to cover your blisters. Off you go to try a different trail. 
Day two is a mirror image of day one. The trail is steep too soon. Your legs are tired too fast. And if the backpack felt full of sandbags yesterday, today it feels as though it contains concrete blocks. And guess who you hear coming up the trail behind you? That's right, the cheerful guide and his gaggle of fortunate followers. You step to the side of the trail and let them pass. One of them is whistling. A couple are chatting. The guide makes a joke and the others laugh. And you? (laughs) Think arthritic pack mule. Within a few miles, you come upon the group again, and they are, you guessed it, sitting in a meadow, eating a picnic lunch, enjoying a nature presentation. We have homemade ice cream, the guide announces. Let's eat it up. And you grumble something about the inequities of life, turn around and walk back to the hotel. You spend the afternoon watching reality TV and eating your PB&J. Day three and four, identical to days one and two. On day five, you don't even leave the hotel lobby. And you are minding your own business when you hear someone call your name. You look up. It is the hiking guide. I've been looking for you, he says. Where have you been? What? I've been hoping you would be a part of our daily hikes. They are included in your package. The lectures, the food, it's all part of the deal. Maybe you didn't read the brochure we sent. I guess I didn't. We take care of everything. We truck your pack up the trail so you don't have to carry it. We have a team that prepares a gourmet meal. And, well, (laughs) you get me. I know these trails better than anyone. And my job is to lead you into the high country. Really? How did I miss that? There is a weariness among us. We are weary from the loads we carry and the challenges we face. We have questions we cannot answer and problems we cannot solve. We had hoped that life would be an invigorating pilgrimage, a high country adventure. We never expected to grow so tired so soon. We grow weary on the walk. Yet, what if there is help, someone to walk with you and guide you to shoulder the load? And what if this help was heaven sent? not another person who, like you, is prone to blisters and leg cramps, someone who is ever strong, never tires, always near, unhindered by what hinders us. Interested? Pack away the Band-Aids and PB&Js. No more blisters for you, my friend. A better climb awaits. Chapter 1. The Holy Who? We have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit, Acts 19.2. And now I will send the Holy Spirit upon you, just as my Father promised. Don't begin telling others yet. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Luke 24.49 I began attending church as a youngster, gung-ho and willing to tackle the mountain. I was barely into double-digit years before I was reading my Bible, memorizing scriptures, and doing my dead-level best to obey every command I heard from the pulpit. I hoisted the backpack of good Christian living and set out to scale the lofty peaks of morality, spirituality, and devotion. Always tell the truth, never lag in faith, pray more, do more, believe more, and believe me, I tried. But boy, did that trail grow steep. Peer pressure, raging hormones, and guilt conspired to convince me I'd never make it. Can a 15-year-old suffer spiritual burnout? Well, this one did. Maybe you know the feeling. 
The fire in your belly is running low on kindling, but where is the firewood? It's not for lack of searching. The Lord knows you've tried, at least you hope he knows. You've signed up and stood up for everything you know to be right and good, yet why this cold wind in the face? Why this uphill struggle, these gray skies, this empty spot? Something's missing, and for the life of you, the life of you feels as if it is fading, drip by drip, little by little, day by day. If that is you, can we talk? Can we start with this? The Lord does know. He does care. It is not His will that you lead a lifeless life. He has something, no, someone you need to know. I do not recall being told about this source of strength. I don't fault anyone. After all, I owned a Bible. I could have searched the pages. Yet had you asked me to explain him to you, I would have just shrugged and said, The holy who? Ask people, Who is God the Father? They have a ready reply. Or, Describe God the Son, most will not hesitate to answer. But if you want to see them him, haw, and search for words, ask, Who is the Holy Spirit? Part of the challenge is found in the terms. God is Father, we comprehend that image. God is Jesus, the Son, that idea is manageable as well. But God is Spirit. Well, the word itself is mystical. I do recall an early encounter with him. I was wrapping up my senior year of high school when a wonderful thing happened in our small West Texas town. An evangelist from a far-off country called California showed up in a school bus that had been painted to look like a flower garden. He was a convert in the Jesus movement that was sweeping the country in the early 1970s. He wore shoulder-length hair and bell-bottom jeans. He set up camp in the school parking lot and began preaching about Christ and the power of the Spirit. By that time in my life, I'd abandoned the steep mountain trail of spirituality and the only spirit I knew came in the form of a liquor store bottle. The hippie preacher invited a group of us to attend a Bible study in homes and learn more, so I went to one. The address I was given took me to a trailer house on the edge of town. I didn't know anyone there, but everyone was very kind. We sat on the floor, read from the book of Acts, and for the first time that I can recall, I heard someone describe the work of the Holy Spirit. The exact words I've long since forgotten, but the sentiment I readily remember. The Spirit is your life-giving friend here to lead you home. When we prayed, a couple of people prayed in a language I'd never heard. They asked if I'd like to pray in the same manner. I said yes. I tried, but nothing happened. Even so, I was impressed. These people didn't seem trail-weary. They were invigorated, and their eyes lit up when they spoke about the Spirit. You might expect my story to take a dramatic turn at this point. A Damascus Road moment, perhaps, Saul becoming Paul. But alas, there was no bright light in the trailer park. I didn't become an apostle or write epistles. Quite the contrary, I was so convinced that I was unqualified to walk with the Spirit, I didn't even try. More years of prodigal living ensued. The pig pen became my home address, and the other pigs were my tribe. Worse still, I continued to call myself a Christian, hopping nightclubs on Saturday nights, sitting in a pew on Sunday mornings. I was the hypocrite who turns others away from Christ. In my early 20s, a dear man, who eventually became a dear friend, helped me believe that God's grace was greater 
than my rebellion. I knelt at a church altar, trusted heaven's mercy, and set out on the trail again. Forgiveness became my message, my life story. I changed my career path. I went through seminary, served churches in Miami and Rio de Janeiro, and eventually settled down to pastor in San Antonio, Texas. And that's where the wheels came off again. If you think the trail of Christian living is steep for a youngster, it is even more so for a minister. I resolved to study hard, counsel wisely, solve problems, organize committees, and satisfy each cranky member. I maintained a game face for three or four years, but somewhere in my mid-thirties, I ran out of fuel. Suddenly, I could not sleep. How does a person lose the ability to sleep? I'd climb into bed and listen to the relaxed breathing of my wife. I'd imagine my three young daughters snoozing in their beds down the hall. I'd think about my friends and co-workers, each of whom was resting peacefully. Our dog was sleeping. Our goldfish was sleeping. And me? My mind was racing, a Ferrari on a time trial. I thought of members to be called, decisions to be made. On more than one Sunday morning, I stood before the church having had little, if any, sleep. I was desperate. Was this the season in which I found the Holy Spirit? Well, sort of. It would be more accurate to say the Spirit found me. In those late night hours when I could not sleep, I would climb out of bed and pad down the stairs, and kneel at our couch and prayed, dejected figure I was, not Max the pastor, not Max the church leader. That fellow in the crumpled pajamas was Max the depleted, confused disciple. My prayers were moans. My faith was a frazzled thread. I couldn't even summon the energy to fake it. I was honest, honest to God, I was. Turns out God has a soft spot for an honest prayer. Little by little, I began to sense the Spirit. He led with a kind touch. He wooed with a whisper. Mysterious? By all means. But figment of my imagination? Nope, not at all. I requested strength. He gave it. I asked the Spirit to heal the sick, and more than once he did. I prayed for vitality and joy, and both returned the long winter thawed into a welcome spring. One day, while studying for a message, I read the words Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, comforter and friend, and I recall having this wonderful realization. I know that person. Now, that was three decades ago. I no longer think of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Who. I now call him our heaven-sent helper. He is the ally of the saint. He is our champion, our advocate, and our guide. He comforts and directs us. He indwells, transforms, sustains, and will someday deliver us into our heavenly home. He is the executor of God's will on earth today, here to infuse us with strength, supernatural strength. Was this not the promise of Jesus? He would not let his followers begin their ministries unless they knew the Holy Spirit. Don't begin telling others yet. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Luke 24, 49. By this point, the disciples had spent three years in training. They had sat with him around campfires, walked with him through cities, witnessed him banish disease and command demons. They knew his favorite food, jokes, and hangouts, but they were not ready. They had seen the empty tomb, touched his resurrected body, and spent 40 days listening to the resurrected Christ teach about the kingdom but they needed more. 
You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Mark it down. The Holy Spirit comes with power, power to make good choices, keep promises, and silence the inner voices of fear and failure, power to get out of bed, get on with life, get busy about the right things in the right way, power to face the unexpected, unwanted passages of time, power. This is what Jesus promised then. This is what Jesus promises still. How is your power level? Now, perhaps you have all the power you need. Life is a downhill stroll through a pleasant meadow. You never lack energy, enthusiasm, or strength. Your step has a spring to it. Your voice has a song to it. You are ever the joyful, empowered person. If that describes you, can I recommend a book on honesty? If that doesn't describe you, consider the possibility of a life-giving relationship with the Holy Spirit. No more walking this path alone. No more carrying weight you were not intended to bear. It's time for you to enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit and experience the vigorous life He offers. Your Bible makes more than a hundred references to the Holy Spirit. Jesus says more about the Spirit than He does the church, marriage, finances, and the future. Why the emphasis on him? God does not want a bunch of stressed out, worn out, done in, and washed up children representing him in the world. He wants us to be fresher day by day, hour by hour. But let's be careful. The topic of the Holy Spirit seems to bring out the extremists among us. On one hand, there are the show-offs. These are the people who make us feel unspiritual by appearing super spiritual. They are buddy-buddy with the Spirit, wear a backstage pass, and want everyone to see their healing gifts, hear their mystical tongue. They make a ministry out of making others feel less than godly, and they like to show off. On the opposite extreme is the Spirit Patrol. They clamp down on anything that seems out of line or out of control. They are self-deputized hall monitors of the supernatural. If an event can't be explained, they dismiss it. Somewhere in between is the healthy saint. He has a childlike heart. She has a high regard for Scripture. He is open to fresh strength. She is discerning and careful. Both he and she seek to follow the Spirit, and they clutch with both hands this final promise of Jesus, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Is it your desire to know the Holy Spirit better and to nurture your relationship with Him? Then you and I are on the same page. Scripture employs more than a dozen metaphors to describe the work of the Spirit. In fact, it is a testimony to His grandeur that one metaphor will not suffice. Do you want to be wowed by Jesus? Well, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher, John 14, 26. Do you struggle to obey God's commands? Well, the Spirit is the wind of God, John 3 and verse 8. Do your prayers seem weak? He is our intercessor, Romans 8, 26. Unsure of your salvation? He is the seal of heaven upon the saint, Ephesians 1, 13. The Spirit is the dove of peace who calms us, the gift giver who equips us, the river of living water who flows out of us to refresh the world, Matthew 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, in John 7, 37 through 39. The list goes on. Over the next few pages, we will ponder the amazing benefit of the divine presence. And whether this is a fresh encounter or your first encounter, it does not matter. God wants you to have the energizing strength of the Holy Spirit. 
Some time ago, I was driving from one place to the next when I realized my gas tank was nearly empty. My indicator said I had less than 10 miles worth of fuel. I spotted a convenience store and parked next to a pump. I placed the nozzle in my tank, swiped my card, and began filling up my car. I then set out to do all the things we do at such locations. I went into the store and bought a soda. I chatted with the store clerk. I thought about buying a hot dog, but reflected on its contents and decided not to do so. I went back to my car and washed the windshield and emptied some trash out of my car. I removed the nozzle from the gas tank, climbed into my car, and was barely back on the road when I happened to look down at my gas gauge. It was on empty. I'd like to say the pump clicked off prematurely. Knowing me and my attention span, however, I probably forgot to squeeze the lever. I did everything except for the one thing I needed to do. Does that describe your life? Have you forgotten the one thing you need to do? Have you neglected the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God longs to give you His great power. He will guide, teach, and energize you. He will shoulder the burdens you were never intended to carry. Challenges come with life, but they need not define your life. Help is here. Chapter 2. Come Alongside Me. The Spirit as a Teacher. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John 14, 26. I can't recall the fellow's name, Marco, Flavio, Luigi, it was an Italian name, for he was an Italian. He had that rugged Mediterranean look about him, dark hair, olive skin, and a handsome smile. He wore loose-fitting slacks, a silk shirt, and loafers. Pretty classy clothes. Then again, he was Italian. He studied history in the university and made a living by leading tours through Rome. When our family had the opportunity to see the city, a friend of a friend of a friend gave us his name. He asked us what we wanted to see. Catacombs, Colosseums, statues of Caesar. Of course, we wanted to see all those, but the site at the top of my list, my numero uno, was the Sistine Chapel. His eyes lit up. You know that classic Italian gesture of kissing the tips of the fingers as if something is of exquisite taste? He did it and said, the Sistine Chapel, I will take you there. He knew everything, the quickest route to the Vatican, the shortest lines in the Vatican, the names of the guards of the Vatican. He talked the entire time, all about the Sistine Chapel, the story of Michelangelo, the scaffolding and the painting on the ceiling that forever changed the way we see Western art. He walked fast, spoke faster, and by the time we arrived, I wondered if the chapel would live up to its billing. It most certainly did. We craned our necks and looked up at the ceiling. After a few moments, I glanced in his direction, and he was smiling. He was thrilled that we were thrilled. He had this, see, I told you, expression on his face. For a few moments, he said nothing. But then he scurried over next to me and in a whispered voice appropriate to the location, pointed out details I would never have noticed without him. He walked me over to the corners to get a better view. He used Italian terms, but he was so enthused I didn't ask him to translate. He changed the way I saw the chapel. I had admired it from afar. I had appreciated it from a distance, but on that day, I was thrilled by it in person. Wouldn't it be great if someone could do for the story of Jesus what this Italian did for the chapel? If only we had an expert to teach us, someone who knows Christ the way my friend knew the Sistine Chapel, someone who can reveal him and remind us about him, someone whose assignment is to stir in us a thrill about our Savior. That someone 
is alive and well. And while I cannot recall the name of the fellow in Rome, Jesus made sure we all would learn the name of the helper he left in charge. He called him the paraclete. The word appears only five times in Scripture, and of those five times, Jesus used it four, and he did so on the night before his crucifixion. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, paraclete, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The helper, paraclete, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. When the helper, paraclete, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, paraclete, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 14, 16 through 17, 26, chapter 15, verse 26, 16, verses 7 and 8, 13 and 14. So much in these passages deserves our attention. Look at the unity of the Trinity. The Son will ask the Father, and the Father will send the Spirit. There is a happy cooperation at work here, as if to say, all of heaven sends help in the direction of the disciples of Jesus. Also, take note of the pronoun. Jesus doesn't want us to think of the Holy Spirit as an it or a thing. The Spirit is a person, and like a person, the Spirit has intellect, emotions, and will. The Spirit speaks to the churches, Revelation 2, 7, intercedes for the believer, Romans 8, 26, leads and commands the disciples, Acts 8, 29, 16, 6 through 7. The Spirit appoints elders, Acts 20, 28, searches all things, 1 Corinthians 2, 10, knows the mind of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 11, and teaches the content of the gospel to us, 1 Corinthians 2, 13. The Spirit dwells among and within believers, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Romans 8, 11, 2 Timothy 1, 14, distributes spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, and gives life to those who believe, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. He cries out from within our hearts, Galatians 4, 6, and leads us in the ways of God. Galatians 5.18. He helps us in our weaknesses. Romans 8.26 works all things together for our ultimate good. Romans 8.28 and strengthens believers. Ephesians 3.16. He can be lied to. Acts 5, 3 and 4. Grieved. Ephesians 4.30. Insulted. Hebrews 10.29. And blasphemed. Matthew 12.31 and 32. Now this list would surprise most people. According to one study, only four people in ten believe that the Spirit is a divine person. The rest of those surveyed either don't have an opinion or choose to believe the Spirit is more like a power surge than a divine being who empowers and teaches us. Now, that's regretful. How does one have a friendship with electricity? Can you join me in a pledge? I hereby resolve never to call the Holy Spirit an it. The Spirit is a person, and Jesus calls him the paraclete. Translators land on different yet similar translations for this Greek word. Comforter, King James Version. Counselor, English Standard Version. Advocate, New English Bible. 
Intercessor, Margin of the New American Standard Bible. The Phillips translation interprets the name as someone else to stand by you. The renderings may vary, but the central message is the same. We are not alone. Yet to what end? Is the Holy Spirit simply a divine companion who keeps us company? If so, that would be enough. Yet the Spirit has a specific, overarching mission. His task is to teach us about Jesus. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He will convict the world. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 14, 26, 15, 26, 16, 8, 13, and 14. Who would have imagined The invisible presence of God on earth invites you to enter his classroom and learn from him. The Apostle Paul echoed this point in one of his letters. No one's ever seen or heard anything like this, never so much as imagined anything quite like it, what God has arranged for those who love him. But you've seen it and heard it because God by His Spirit has brought it all out into the open before you. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-10 Secularists look for answers in human philosophy and knowledge. The world religions look to the teachings of their now-dead founders, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius. Christians, however, hold to this inscrutable, and beautiful promise. Our teacher not only spoke, but he speaks. He taught, yes, but he teaches still. His wisdom is not confined to an ancient document, but is part of the day-to-day curriculum of our mentor, the Holy Spirit. As Paul goes on to say, the Spirit, not content to flit around on the surface, dives into the depths of God and brings out what God planned all along. God offers a full report on the gifts of life and salvation that he is giving us. We don't have to rely on the world's guesses and opinions. We didn't learn this by reading books or going to school, but we learned it from God who taught us person to person through Jesus, and we're passing it on to you in the same first-hand personal way. Isaiah's question, is there anyone around who knows God's Spirit? Anyone who knows what he is doing has been answered. Christ knows, and we have Christ's Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.10, 12-13, and verse 16. We are not left alone with our questions. It is not up to us to solve the riddles of our existence. We have a helper, a divine instructor. And he will save us from the cul-de-sac of confusion and the dead end of doubt. He does this by enrolling us in the primary course of his university, Jesus Christ. Look again at the upper room message. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 14, 26, 15, 26, 16, 13 through 14. The chief aim of the Spirit is to escort you into the Sistine Chapel of Jesus and watch as you grow wide-eyed and slack-jawed. 
He will enchant you with the manger, empower you with the cross, embolden you with the empty tomb. He will infect you with his love for the Savior. He is downright bullish on Jesus. J.I. Packer points this out beautifully, saying, It is as if the Spirit stands behind us, throwing light over our shoulder on Jesus who stands facing us. The Spirit's message to us is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me, but always look at him and see his glory. Listen to him and hear his word. Go to him and have life. Get to know him and taste his gift of joy and peace. As Jesus foretold, the Spirit will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 16, 14. A classic example of this truth involves an encounter between two men, Peter, a devout Jew, and Cornelius, a God-fearing, God-seeking Gentile. They met several years after the ascension of Jesus. Their meeting was a complete surprise to Peter. Jews had nothing to do with Gentiles, especially those who served with the Roman army. Cornelius was an outsider. He didn't quote the Torah or descend from Abraham, toga on his body and ham in his freezer, uncircumcised, unkosher, unclean, look at him. Yet, look at him again. He was kind and devout, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always, Acts 10 and verse 2. Cornelius was even on a first-name basis with an angel. The angel told him to get in touch with Peter, who was staying 30 miles away in the seaside town of Joppa. Cornelius sent three messengers to fetch Peter. Peter, however, resisted. But then the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Acts chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. The Spirit threw open the door of the gospel to welcome not just the Jews, but the entire world. Peter already knew that Jesus loved non-Jews. He had spent three years following Christ, yet he needed a reminder, and the Spirit gave it. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance or remind you all things that I have said to you, John 14, 26. The phrase, bring to your remembrance, can mean make contemporary. The Spirit does more than repeat the words of Jesus. He makes them relevant. He unfolds their significance for the world in which we live. I recall an afternoon early in my ministry when the invitation of Jesus to the weary became the invitation of Jesus to Max. I was supposed to be studying, but I could not concentrate. I was in the throes of the weariness I'd described in the last chapter, battling insomnia, a dozen insecurities, and deadlines. I was under the impression that I had to fix everyone's problems, shoulder everyone's burdens, and never grow weary in doing so. After some moments, I moved from my office chair into the chair I used for guests. I bowed my head and sighed. And when I did, this scripture came to mind. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It was the pronoun me that got me. I had been turning to everyone and everything but him. And the words of Jesus went from ink on a page to balm for my soul. Why did that verse come to mind? Simple. The Holy Spirit, my teacher, reminded me. The Spirit of Christ will do this for you, my friend. As J.I. Packer writes, When the Spirit whispers in our ear and makes us aware that Jesus is for real and his invitation is for real also, then he is fulfilling a further ministry, 
a matchmaker ministry, whereby he urges us, draws us, inclines us, moves us to embrace the Lord Jesus, to say yes to his invitation, to go to him and make him by faith our own Savior, our own Lord, our own friend, our own King. Is this not great news? The Spirit, the person present at creation, the one active in incarnation, the moving force in the resurrection, the mighty hand at the final revelation, He is your tutor, and He will reveal new and wondrous things to you. I came home the other day to find my wife, Dinalyn, on the floor playing with our two grandchildren. She had purchased a half a dozen brightly colored matchbox-sized cars. As I walked in, she was pulling them out of the bag. Rose and Max went crazy. That's what you'd expect of a four-year-old and a 20-month-old toddler. Rose knew what to do. She recognized them as self-propelling cars. She took one and rolled it back and forth until the stored energy allowed the car to zip across the floor. Max, on the other hand, had never seen them. The idea was new to him, and Dean was thrilled to thrill him. She was on the tile floor teaching Max how to roll the car back and forth until it was ready to be launched. And when it exploded forward, oh, how he laughed with glee. And when he laughed, Dean laughed twice as loud. She was so excited to see him excited. The paraclete wants to do the same with you. He will be a Dinalyn to your world. The question is, would you be a little Max to his? My grandson modeled the attitude we need, a childlike spirit, hungry to be taught, willing to be led. Humility is the soil out of which the fruit of the Spirit can grow. Invite him into your world. Let your day begin with these words. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Make it your aim to walk in the Spirit by inviting Him into the details of each day. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 Let this prayer be quick to come to your mind. In this moment, what are you teaching me? Or how am I to respond to this challenge, Lord? Or Direct me, please. Which way should I go? Pause and listen. Keep an ear inclined toward the Spirit. I once participated in a golf outing that included caddies. It was amazing. My caddy not only carried my bag, he offered to tell me how to play. As we walked down the first fairway, he said, I'll show you where to hit the ball and which club to use. How do you know? I asked. I've been caddying here for 20 years. I stopped and turned and looked at him. 20 years? How many rounds of golf is that? He looked up at the sky as if he was calculating. Around 10,000. 10,000? He knew each blade of grass by name. Every turn of the green and roll of the hill, he had experienced them. I asked, Is there anything about this course you do not know? Nope. I could play it in the dark. So I peppered him with questions. How far should I hit this shot? He told me. Will this putt roll very fast? He told me. Should I quit golf and take up bowling? He told me. He told me because I asked him. For me not to consult him would have been foolish. For us not to consult the Spirit of God would be the same. He is here to teach us. Our privilege is to stay in mindful communion with Him day by day, moment by moment. Follow Him into the Sistine Chapel of Jesus Christ. Listen as the divine instructor whispers wonders in your ear. Be assured that as you smile, the Spirit smiles with you. After all, He is your teacher. 316, The Numbers of Hope, is one of Max Lucado's all-time best-selling books and has recently been updated for a new generation and is narrated by Max himself. Sometimes life appears to fall to pieces and can seem irreparable. 
We've all had our fair share of disappointments, losses, or hardships. But for every challenge, there is a breathtaking promise. It's going to be okay. How can we know? Because God so loved the world. In 316, pastor and New York Times bestselling author, Max Lucado, offers a word-by-word -word study of one of the best-known passages in the Bible, grounding the verse in the greater context of who Jesus was. Throughout this update and expanded edition of 316, Max will invite you to stand in the awe of how deep, wide, long, and high God's love is for you. Understand more fully the living hope you have through Jesus' death and resurrection, and rest in the assurance that salvation is a gift from God, not something you can earn. If you know nothing about the Bible, start here. John 3.16 invites you to know God's love deeply and intimately. And once you accept God's love, your life will never be the same. Here's Max Lucado reading 3.16, The Numbers of Hope. Faith Gateway is an online community for readers to discover top Christian books and engage with their favorite Christian authors. They bring together content in many different forms, from daily blog posts to book excerpts, daily devotionals, free downloads, videos, giveaways, contests, free online Bible studies, and more. Faith Gateway is brought to you by HarperCollins Christian Publishing, which publishes works from some of the most beloved and most popular Christian authors in the world today. Faith Gateway provides unique opportunities to connect with those authors and their books as you seek answers to your biggest spiritual questions. Whether you are exploring Christianity or involved in full-time Christian ministry, Faith Gateway has the best resources to meet you where you are today and help you get to the next level in your spiritual journey. Faith Gateway is giving Listen Here listeners 15% off their first order with promo code LISTEN. Visit faithgateway.com to shop the store, sign up for daily devotionals, or join the latest free online Bible study. That's faithgateway.com and promo code LISTEN to receive 15% off your first order. I love golf. If only it loved me in return. Alas, it is a one-sided romance. My golf swing is the stuff that keeps an instructor awake at night. One kindly compared it to an octopus falling from a tree. Another said, I know your problem. You're standing too close to the ball after you hit it. Still another suggested that I take a couple of weeks off from golf and then try bowling. One coach refuses to give up on me. He's a terrific friend and experienced sleuth of the game. He works on golf like a mechanic on a V8 engine, taking my swing apart piece by piece. During one lesson, I thought I had done the impossible. I thought I had stumped him. He studied me as I hit ball after ball. He watched from every angle. He stood behind me to either side of me. Finally, I asked him, what do you think I should do? He rested his elbow on a crossed arm and cupped his chin in his hand. I'm not sure. What do you mean? Well, I'm trying to find the one problem that is causing the other nine. We're still looking for it. His approach makes sense. Problems are best solved when traced to their beginnings. This teaching strategy explains my fascination with the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Could a single sentence contain more significance? Consider the weight of its words. God loved world, perish, eternal life. Each phrase deserves a deep dive. Each term warrants its own conversation. Each word merits its own chapter. Hence the book 316. I am grateful that my dear friends at HarperCollins Christian Publishing have chosen to relaunch it for a new generation of readers. When it released in 2007, we had no idea it would be so well-received. 
It's been read by all ages, translated into 25 languages, and used in countless settings, numerous bookstore chains, church denominations, and entire congregations spent focused time examining this life-giving promise. Prisons, small groups, personal studies, stories came from readers around the world who found faith in this 26-word parade of hope whose words have been framed, t-shirted, tattooed, monogrammed, and bannered. Every time I recall these words, they are as fresh and as stunning as my first encounter with them. The mind-bending awareness of God's limitless love, His incalculable sacrifice, and the priceless teaching at the core. How can we not review it again and again? I want this generation and all who come after to look closely at the key promise of God and choose the gift beyond all gifts. John 3.16 does for the human heart what my coach attempted to do for my golf swing. It invites us to get to the root of the human story. We tend to do the opposite. We focus on the fruit. Am I well-employed, well-paid, well-built, or well-received? by people in my world. Valid questions for sure, but John 3.16 bids us to go deeper. Who is God? Why does His love matter? Do I matter? What is meant by perish? Eternal life, is it available to me? John 3.16 takes us upriver to the headwaters of human existence. And once we find our source of life, it's easier to stay on course. I invite you to turn the page and engage with these wonderful words of Jesus. Though spoken more than 2,000 years ago, they are as relevant as this morning's headlines. He loved, He gave, we believe, we live. It's that simple, and it's that vital. Shall we get started? By the way, the jury is still out on my golf swing. A golfing buddy recently gave me this assessment. The good news, you're still going to heaven. The bad news, you won't be on the golf team. Chapter 1, the most famous conversation in the Bible. He's waiting for the shadows. Darkness will afford the cover he covets. So he waits for the safety of nightfall. He sits near the second floor window of his house, sipping olive leaf tea, watching the sunset, biding his time. Jerusalem enchants at this hour. The disappearing sunlight tints the stone streets, gilds the wide houses, and highlights the blockish temple. Nicodemus looks across the slate roofs at the massive square, gleaming and resplendent. He walked its courtyard this morning. He'll do so again tomorrow. He'll gather with the religious leaders and do what religious leaders do, discuss God, discuss reaching God, pleasing God, appeasing God, God. Pharisees converse about God, and Nicodemus sits among them, debating, pondering, solving puzzles, resolving dilemmas, sandal tying on the Sabbath, feeding people who won't work, divorcing your wife, dishonoring parents. What does God say? Nicodemus needs to know it's his job. He's a holy man and leads holy men. His name appears on the elite list of Torah scholars. He dedicated his life to the law and occupies one of the 71 seats of the Judean Supreme Court. He has credentials, clout, and questions. Questions for this Galilean crowd stopper, this backwater teacher who lacks diplomas yet attracts people, who has ample time for the happy hour crowd but little time for the clergy and the holy upper crust. He banishes demons, some say, forgives sin, others claim, 
purifies temples, Nicodemus has no doubt. He witnessed Jesus purge Solomon's porch. He saw the fury, braided whip, flying doves. There will be no pocket padding in my house, Jesus erupted. By the time the dust settled and the coins landed, hustling clerics were running a background check on him. The man from Nazareth won no favor in the temple that day. So Nicodemus comes at night. His colleagues can't know of the meeting. They wouldn't understand. But Nicodemus can't wait until they do. As the shadows darken the city, he steps out, slips unseen through the cobbled, winding streets. He passes servants lighting lamps in the courtyards and takes a path that ends at the door of a simple house. Jesus and his followers are staying here, he's been told. Nicodemus knocks. The noisy room silences as he enters. The men are wharf workers and tax collectors, unaccustomed to the highbrow world of a scholar. They shift in their seats. Jesus motions for the guest to sit. Nicodemus does and initiates the most famous conversation in the Bible. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. John 3 and verse 2. Nicodemus begins with what he knows. I've done my homework, he implies, and your work impresses me. We listen for a kindred salutation from Jesus. Well, and I've heard of you, Nicodemus. We expect, and Nicodemus expected, some hospitable chit-chat. None comes. Jesus makes no mention of Nicodemus's VIP status, good intentions, or academic credentials, not because they don't exist, but because in Jesus's algorithm, they don't matter. He simply issues this proclamation. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 3. Behold the continental divide of Scripture, the international dateline of faith. Nicodemus stands on one side, Jesus on the other, and Christ pulls no punches about their differences. Nicodemus inhabits a land of good efforts, sincere gestures, and hard work. Give God your best, his philosophy says, and God does the rest. Jesus' response your best won't do. Your works won't work. Your finest efforts don't mean squat. Unless you are born again, you can't even see what God is up to. Nicodemus hesitates on behalf of us all. Born again? How can a man be born when he is old? Verse 4. You must be kidding. Put life in reverse. Rewind the tape. Start all over. We can't be born again. Oh, but wouldn't we like to? A do-over. A try again. A reload. Broken hearts and missed opportunities bob in our wake. A mulligan would be nice. Who wouldn't cherish a second shot? But who can pull it off? Nicodemus scratches his chin and chuckles. Yeah. A gray beard like me gets a maternity ward recall? Jesus doesn't crack a smile. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 5. About this time, a gust of wind blows a few leaves to the still open door. Jesus picks one off the floor and holds it up. God's power works like that wind, Jesus explains. Newborn hearts are born of heaven. You can't wish, earn, or create one. New birth? Inconceivable. God handles the task, start to finish. And Nicodemus looks around the room at the followers. Their blank expressions betray equal bewilderment. 
Old Nick has no hook upon which to hang such thoughts. He speaks self-fix, but Jesus speaks and indeed introduces a different language, not works born of men and women, but a work done by God. Born again. Birth, by definition, is a passive act. The in-wound child contributes nothing to the delivery. Postpartum celebrations applaud the work of the mother. No one lionizes the infant. Great work there, little one. No, give the taika, pacifier, not a medal. Mom deserves the gold. She exerts the effort. She pushes, agonizes, and delivers. When my niece bore her first child, she invited her brother and mother to stand in the delivery room. After witnessing three hours of pushing, when the baby finally crowned, my nephew turned to his mom and said, I'm sorry for every time I talked back to you. The mother pays the price of birth. She doesn't enlist the child's assistance or solicit his or her advice. Why would she? The baby can't even take a breath without umbilical help, much less navigate a path into new life. Nor, Jesus is saying, can we. Spiritual rebirthing requires a capable parent, not an able infant. Who is this parent? Check the strategically selected word again. The Greek language offers two choices for again. Number one, Palin, which means a repetition of an act to redo what was done earlier. Number two, anathen, which also depicts a repeated action, but requires the original source to repeat it. It means from above, from a higher place, things which come from heaven or God. In other words, the one who did the work the first time does it again. And this is the word Jesus chose. The difference between the two terms is the difference between a painting by da Vinci and one by me. Suppose you and I are standing in the Louvre admiring the famous Mona Lisa. Inspired by the work, I produce an easel and canvas and announce, I'm going to paint this beautiful portrait again. And I do. Right there in the Sol des Etats, I brandish my palette and flurry my brush and recreate the Mona Lisa. Alas, Licato is no Leonardo. Miss Lisa has a Picasso-esque imbalance to her, crooked nose and one eye higher than the other. Technically, however, I keep my pledge and paint the Mona Lisa again. Jesus means something else. He employs the second Greek term calling for the action of the original source. He uses the word anathen, which, if honored in the Paris gallery, would require da Vinci's presence. Anathen excludes latter-day replicas, second-generation attempts, well-meaning imitations. He who did it first must do it again. The original creator recreates his creation. This is the act that Jesus describes. Born, God exerts the effort. Again, God restores the beauty. We don't try again. We need not the muscle of self, but a miracle of God. Well, the thought cold cocks Nicodemus. How can this be? Verse 9. And Jesus answers by leading him to the hope diamond of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. A 26-word parade of hope, beginning with God, ending with life, and urging us to do the same brief enough to write on a napkin or memorize in a moment, yet solid enough to weather 2,000 years of storms and questions. If you know nothing of the Bible, start here. If you know everything in the Bible, return here. We all need the reminder. The heart of the human problem is the heart of the human, 
and God's treatment is prescribed in John 3, 16. He loved, he gave, we believe, we live. The words are to Scripture what the Mississippi River is to America, an entryway into the heartland. Believe or dismiss them, embrace or reject them. Any serious consideration of Christ must include them. Would a British historian dismiss the Magna Carta? Egyptologists overlook the Rosetta Stone? Could you ponder the words of Christ and never immerse yourself into John 3, 16? The verse is an alphabet of grace, a table of contents to the Christian hope. Each word a safe deposit box of jewels. Consider it again and note the word that snatches your attention. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. We'd expect an anger-fueled God, one who punishes the world, recycles the world, forsakes the world, but loves the world. The world? This world? Heartbreakers, hope snatchers, and dream dousers prowl this orb. Dictators rage. Abusers inflict. Reverends think they deserve the title. But God loves, and he loves the world so much, he gave his declarations, rules, dicta, edicts. No, the heart-stilling, mind-bending, deal-making or breaking claim of John 3.16 is this. God gave his son, his only son, no abstract ideas, but a flesh-wrapped divinity. Scripture equates Jesus with God. God then gave himself. Why? So that whoever believes in him shall not perish. John Newton, who set faith to music in Amazing Grace, loved this barrier-breaking pronoun. He said, if I read God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that when John Newton believed he should have everlasting life, I should say, perhaps, there is some other John Newton. But whosoever means this John Newton and the other John Newton and everybody else, whatever his name may be, whoever, a universal word, and perish, a sobering word. Oh, we'd like to dilute, if not delete the term. Not Jesus. He pounds do not enter signs on every square inch of Satan's gate and tells those hell-bent on entering to do so over his dead body. Even so, some souls insist. In the end, some perish and some live. And what determines the difference? not works or talents, pedigrees or possessions. Nicodemus had these in hordes. The difference is determined by our belief. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Bible translators in the New Hebrides Islands struggled to find an appropriate verb for believe. This was a serious problem as the word and the concept are essential to Scripture. One Bible translator, John G. Patton, accidentally came upon a solution while hunting with the tribesmen. The two men bagged a large deer and carried it on a pole along a steep mountain path to Patton's home. When they reached the veranda, both men dropped the load and plopped into the porch chairs. As they did so, the native exclaimed in the language of his people, My, it is good to stretch yourself out here and rest. Patton immediately reached for paper and pencil and recorded the phrase. As a result, his final translation of John 3.16 could be worded, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever stretcheth 
himself out on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Stretch out on Christ and rest. Martin Luther did. When the great reformer was dying, severe headaches left him bedfast and pain-struck. He was offered a medication to relieve the discomfort. He declined and explained, My best prescription for head and heart is that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The best prescription for head and heart. Who couldn't benefit from a dose? As things turned out, Nicodemus took his share. When Jesus was crucified, the theologian showed up with Joseph of Arimathea. The two offered their respects and oversaw Jesus' burial. No small gesture given the Antichrist climate of the day. When word hit the streets that Jesus was out of the tomb and back on his feet, don't you know Nicodemus smiled and thought of his late-night chit-chat? Born again, eh? Who would have thought he'd start with himself? Chapter 2. No one like him. For God so loved the world. If only I could talk to the pilot. Thirty seconds would do. Face to face. Just an explanation. He was, after all, the one bumping my wife and me from his plane. Not that I could blame him. Dylan had picked up more than souvenirs in Hong Kong. On the plane, she was so nauseous, I had to wheelchair her through the airport. She flopped onto her seat and pillowed her head against the window, and I promised to leave her alone for the 14-hour flight. I had a simple goal. Get Dylan on the plane. The airline staff had an opposite one. Get Dinalyn off. Fault me for their fear. When a concerned flight attendant inquired about my wife's condition, I sent shockwaves through the fuselage with my answer. Virus. Attendants converged on our seats like police at a crime scene. Presidential news conferences have stirred fewer questions. How long has she been sick? Did you see a doctor? Have you considered swimming home? I downplayed Deanland's condition. Just give us one barf bag and we're happy travelers. No one laughed. Apparently, bug-bearing patrons compete with terrorists for the title Most Unwanted Passenger. The virus word reached the pilot, and the pilot rendered his verdict. Not on my plane. You must leave, his bouncer informed matter-of-factly. Says who? The pilot. I leaned sideways and looked down the aisle for the man in charge, but the cockpit door was closed. If only I could talk to him, present my side. We didn't deserve banishment. We pay our taxes, vote in primaries, tip waiters. I wanted to plead my case, but the man in charge was unavailable for comment. He had a 747 to fly, 7,000 miles to navigate, and no time for us. A few disheartening minutes later, Deanlin and I found ourselves back at the gate, making plans to spend an extra night in China. As an airline representative made a list of hotel phone numbers, I noticed the plane pulling away, hurrying over to the airport window. I stared into the cockpit, hoping for a glimpse of the mystery aviator. I waved both arms and mouthed my request. Can we talk? He didn't stop. I never saw his face. But if you're reading this, sir or ma'am, perhaps we could chat. Can you relate? You may feel similar sentiments about the pilot of the universe. God, the too-busy-for-you commander-in-chief, the faceless skipper who passes down non-negotiable decisions. His universe hums like a Rolls-Royce. 
but sick passengers never appear on his radar screen. Even worse, you may suspect a vacant captain's seat. How do we know a hand secures the controls? Can we assume the presence of a pilot behind the steel door? Christ weighs in decidedly on this discussion. He escorts passengers to the cockpit, enters 316 in the keypad, and unlocks the door to God. No Bible verse better expresses his nature. We ought to submit it to Webster's. Every word in the passage explains the second one, for God so loved the world. Jesus assumes what Scripture declares, God is. For proof, venture away from the city lights on a clear night and look up at the sky. That fuzzy band of white light is our galaxy, the Milky Way, 100 billion stars. Our galaxy is one of billions of others. Who can conceive of such a universe, let alone infinite numbers of universes? No one can, but let's try anyway. Suppose you attempt to drive to the sun. A car dealer offers you a sweet deal on a space vehicle, no doubt solar-powered, that averages 150 miles per hour. You hop in, open the moonroof, and blast off, and you drive non-stop, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Any guess as to the length of your trip? Try 70 years. Suppose after stretching your legs and catching a bit of sun, you fuel up and rocket off to Alpha Centauri, the next closest star system. Best pack a lunch and clear your calendar. You'll need 15 million years to make the trip. Don't like to drive, you say? Well, board a jet and zip through our solar system at a blistering 600 miles per hour. In 16 and a half days, you'll reach the moon. In 17 years, you'll pass the sun. And in 690 years, you can enjoy dinner on Pluto. After seven centuries, you haven't even left our solar system, much less our galaxy. Our universe is God's preeminent missionary. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19 in verse 1. A house implies a builder. A painting suggests a painter. Don't stars suggest a star maker? Doesn't creation imply a creator? The heavens declare his righteousness, Psalm 97 in verse 6. Look above you. Now, look within you. Look at your sense of right and wrong, your code of ethics. Somehow, even as a child, you knew it was wrong to hurt people and right to help them. Who told you? Who says? What is this magnetic pole that pulls the needles on the compass of your conscience, if not God? You aren't alone with your principles. Common virtues connect us. Every culture has frowned upon selfishness and celebrated courage, punished dishonesty, and rewarded nobility. Even cannibals display rudimentary justice, usually refusing to eat their children. A universal standard exists. Just as a code writer connects computers with common software bundles, a common code connects people. We may violate or ignore the code, but we can't deny it. Even people who have never heard God's name sense His law within them. There is something deep within humanity that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Romans 2 and verse 15. When atheists decry injustice, they can thank God for the ability to discern it. The conscience is God's fingerprint, proof of His existence. Heavens above, moral code within, pings indicating the presence of an 
occupied cockpit. Someone got this plane airborne, and it wasn't any of us. There is a pilot, and he is unlike anyone we've seen. To whom then will you compare God, the prophet invites? Isaiah 40 and verse 18. To whom indeed? Human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. Acts 17 and verse 25. You and I start our days needy. Indeed, basic needs prompt us to get out of bed. Not God. Uncreated and self-sustaining, he depends on nothing and no one, never taken a nap or a breath, needs no food, counsel, or physician. The Father has life in himself, John 5 and verse 26. Life is to God what wetness is to water, and air is to wind. He is not just alive, but life itself. God is without help. Hence, he always is. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 90 and verse 2. God never began and will never cease. He exists endlessly, always. The number of his years is unsearchable. Job 36 and verse 26. Even so, let's try to search them. Let every speck of sand from the Sahara to South Beach represent a billion years of God's existence. With some super vacuum, suck and then blow all the particles into a mountain and count how many you have. Multiply your total by a billion and then listen as God reminds, they don't represent a fraction of my existence. He is the eternal God, Romans 16 and verse 26. He invented time and owns the patent. The day is yours and yours also the night. Psalm 74 and verse 16. He was something before anything else was. When the first angel lifted the first wing, God had already always been. Most staggering of all, he has never messed up, not once. The prophet Isaiah described his glimpse of God. He saw six-winged angels. Though sinless, they covered themselves in God's presence. Two wings covered eyes, two wings covered feet, two wings carried the angels airborne. They volleyed one phrase back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6 and verse 3. God is holy, every decision exact, each word appropriate, never out of bounds, never out of place not even tempted to make a mistake. God is impervious to evil, James 1 and verse 13. Tally this up. No needs, no age, no sin. No wonder, he said, I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. But is God's grandness good news? When Isaiah saw it, He came unraveled. Woe is me, for I am undone. Isaiah 6 and verse 5. Competent pilots boot sick people off the plane. An all-powerful God might do likewise. Shouldn't the immensity of his universe intimidate us? It did Carl Sagan. A lifetime of studying the skies led the astronomer to conclude, Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark, in our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Understandable pessimism. In the cockpit, God, who has no needs, age, or sin. Bouncing in the back of the plane, Max, burger dependent, half asleep, Compared to God, I have the lifespan of a fruit fly. And sinless, I can't maintain a holy thought for my two-minute morning commute. Is God's greatness good news? 
not without the next four words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Try that mantra on for size. The one who holds the aces holds your heart. The one who formed you pulls for you. Untrumpable power stoked by unstoppable love. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 and verse 31. God does for you what Bill Tucker's father did for him. Bill was 16 years old when his dad suffered a health crisis and consequently had to leave his business. Even after Mr. Tucker regained his health, the Tucker family struggled financially, barely getting by. Mr. Tucker, an entrepreneurial sort, came up with an idea. He won the bid to reupholster the chairs at the local movie theater. Well, this stunned the family. He had never stitched a seat. He didn't even own a sewing apparatus. Still, he found someone to teach him the skill and located an industrial strength machine. The family scraped together every cent they had to buy it. They drained savings accounts and dug coins out of the sofa. Finally, they had enough. It was a fine day when Bill rode with his dad to pick up the equipment. Bill remembers a jovial, hour-long trip discussing the bright horizons this new opportunity afforded them. They loaded the machine in the back of their truck and secured it right behind the cab. Mr. Tucker then invited his son to drive home. I'll let Bill tell you what happened. As we were driving along, we were excited, and I, like any 16-year-old driver, was probably not paying enough attention to my speed. Just as we were turning on the clover leaf to get on the expressway, I will never, ever forget watching that sewing machine, which was already top-heavy, begin to tip. I slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. I saw it go over the side. I jumped out and ran around the back of the truck. As I rounded the corner, I saw our hope and our dream lying on its side in pieces. And then I saw my dad just looking, all of his risk and all of his endeavor and all of his struggling and all of his dream, all of his hope to take care of his family was lying there, shattered. You know what comes next, don't you? Stupid punk kid driving too fast, not paying attention, ruin the family by taking away our livelihood. But that's not what he said. He looked right at me. Oh, Bill, I am so sorry. And he walked over and put his arms around me and said, Son, this is going to be okay. God is whispering the same to you. Those are his arms you feel. Trust him. That is his voice you hear. Believe him. Allow the only decision maker in the universe to comfort you. Life at times appears to fall to pieces, seems irreparable, but it's going to be okay. How can you know? Because God so loved the world. And since he has no needs, you cannot tire him. Since he is without age, you cannot lose him. And since he has no sin, you cannot corrupt him. If God can make a billion galaxies, can't he make good out of our bad and sense out of our faltering lives? Of course he can. He is God. He not only flies the plane, but he knows the passengers and has a special place for those who are sick and ready to get home. Chapter 3, Hope for the Hard Heart, For God So Loved the World. I saw a woman today who finally became hard as wood all over. French physician Guy Patin wrote those words in 1692, the first clinical description of fibrodysplasia ossificans 
Progressiva, or F-O-P. He unknowingly introduced the world to a cryptic disease that slowly, irreversibly turns its victims into a mass of solid bone. Healthy skeletal systems are hinged together with ligaments and tendons. The bony figure hanging in the science classroom teaches this. Remove the connective tissues and the frame collapses into a pile of loose bones. FOP, however, hardens the soft tissues like muscles and tendons, rendering the body an ossified suit of armor. Consider the case of FOP victim Nancy Sando. When she was five, doctors diagnosed a mass on the back of her neck as terminal cancer and gave her three months to live. But she didn't die. No tumor grew. Her bones did, however. Doctors began to suspect the presence of the bone condition. By the time she was in her mid-30s, her frame was frozen in a near straight posture, mildly bent at the waist. Her neck was locked, jaw fused, and elbows fixed at right angles. Injuries often trigger the FOP sprawl. Bones overreact to a bruise or break, spreading like renegade cement through the system. The pattern is predictable. Neck and spine solidify first, then shoulders, hips, and elbows. Over years, the disease can imprison the entire body, back to front, head to toe, proximal to distal. The rogue gene of FOP has one aim, harden the body a little more every day. As tragic as this disease is, Scripture describes one even worse, the calcification not of bones, but of the will. I look at this people. Oh, what a stubborn, hard-headed people. Exodus 32 and verse 9. God spoke these words to Moses on Mount Sinai. The disloyalty of the calf-worshiping Hebrews stunned God. He had given them a mayor's seat perch at his Exodus extravaganza. They saw water transform into blood, high noon change to a midnight sky, the Red Sea turn into a red carpet, and the Egyptian army become fish bait. God gave manna with the morning dew, quail with the evening sun. He earned their trust. The former slaves had witnessed a millennium of miracles in a matter of days, yet when God called Moses to a summit meeting, the people panicked like henless chicks. They rallied around Aaron and said, Do something. Make gods for us who will lead us. That Moses, the man who got us out of Egypt, who knows what's happened to him? Exodus 32 and verse 1. The scurvy of fear infected everyone in the camp. They crafted a metal cow and talked to it. God, shocked at the calf-praising service, commanded Moses, Go, get down there. They've turned away from the way I commanded them. Oh, what a stubborn, hard-headed people. Verses 7 through 9. Remember how FOP spreads in an unhealthy response to pain? Our hearts harden in an unhealthy reaction to fear. Note, the presence of fear in the Hebrews didn't bother God. Their response to it did. Nothing persuaded the people to trust Him. Plagues didn't. Liberation from slavery didn't. God shed light on their path and dropped food in their laps, and they still didn't believe Him. Nothing penetrated their hearts. They were flinty, stiff, Mount Rushmore is more pliable, an anvil more tender. The people were as responsive as the gold statue they worshipped. More than 3,000 years removed, we understand God's frustration. Turn to a statue for help? How stupid! 
Face your fears by facing a cow utterly foolish. We opt for more sophisticated therapies. Belly stretching food binges or budget busting shopping sprees. We bow before a whiskey bottle or lose ourselves in an 80 hour work week. Progress? Hardly. We still face fears without facing God. He sends Exodus level demonstrations of power, sunsets, starry nights, immeasurable oceans. He solves Red Sea caliber problems, and airdrops blessings like morning manna. But let one crisis surface, let Moses disappear for a few hours, and we tornado into chaos. Rather than turn to God, we turn from him, hardening our hearts. The result? Cow-worshiping folly. According to heaven's medical diagnosis, Hard-hearted people are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness, and they wander from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Ephesians 4, 17-19. Measure the irregular pulse of the hard heart, hopelessly confused. Minds of darkness have no sense of shame. Live for lustful pleasure. Practice every kind of impurity. Morticians render a brighter diagnosis. No wonder Scripture says, He who hardens his heart falls into trouble. Proverbs 28 and verse 14. But it gets worse. A hard heart ruins not only your life, but the lives of your family members. As an example, Jesus identified the hard heart as the wrecking ball of a marriage. When asked about divorce, Jesus said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning, Matthew 19 and verse 8. When one or both people in a marriage stop trusting God to save it, they sign its death certificate. They reject the very one who can help them. My executive assistant, Karen Hill, saw the result of such stubbornness in a pasture. A cow stuck her nose into a paint can and couldn't shake it off. Can nose cows can't breathe well, and they can't drink or eat at all. Both the cow and her calf were in danger. A serious bovine bind. Karen's family set out to help. But when the cow saw their rescuers coming, she set out for pasture. They pursued, but the cow escaped. They chased that cow for three days. Each time the posse drew near, the cow ran. Finally, using pickup trucks and ropes, they cornered and decanned the cow. Seen any can-nosed people lately? Malnourished souls, dehydrated hearts, people who can't take a deep breath, all because they stuck their noses where they shouldn't, and when God came to help, they ran away. When billions of us imitate the cow, chaos erupts. Nations of bullheaded people ducking God and bumping into each other. We scamper, starve and struggle. Ken knows craziness. Isn't this the world we see? This is the world God sees, yet this is the world God loves. For God so loved the world, this hard-hearted, stiff-necked world. We bow before gold-plated cows. Still, He loves us. We stick our noses where we shouldn't. Still, He pursues us. We run from the very one who can help, but he doesn't give up. He loves, he pursues, he persists. And every so often, a heart begins to soften. Let yours be one of them. Here's how. Don't forget what God has done for you. Jesus performed two bread-multiplying miracles. In one, he fed 5,000 people. In the other, 4,000. 
Still, his disciples, who witnessed both feasts, worried about empty pantries. A frustrated Jesus rebuked them. Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Don't you remember anything at all? Mark 8, 17 through 18. Short memories harden the heart. Make careful note of God's blessings. Declare with David, I will daily add praise to praise. I'll write the book on your righteousness. Talk up your salvation the live long day. Never run out of good things to write or say. Psalm 71, 14 through 15. Catalog God's goodnesses. Meditate on them. He has fed you, led you, and earned your trust. Remember what God has done for you and acknowledge what you have done against God. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10. Sin hoarding stiffens us. Confession softens us. When my daughters were small, they liked to play with Play-Doh. They formed figures out of the soft clay. If they forgot to place the lid on the can, the substance hardened. When it did, they brought it to me. My hands were bigger, my fingers stronger. I could mold the stony stuff into putty. Is your heart hard? Take it to your father. You're only a prayer away from tenderness. You live in a hard world, but you don't have to live with a hard heart. Thank you for spending time with us, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen Here. Check back next week for more audiobook samples and maybe a special guest or two. Follow us wherever you listen to podcasts or find us on Instagram and TikTok at Listen Here Podcast or visit our website, listenherepodcast.com for more information or to find the books we've talked about.